All right, next we're gonna hear from our very own Dean of Spiritual Life, Jacob Ravenscraft on, he's gonna share some vision for SL and specifically what tonight is gonna look like and what space we're creating here tonight. So Jacob. Give it up for Shine and Brian and Guys, we are just so grateful for you guys to be here. You guys, you guys excited to be here tonight? Come on. Hey, we're excited to worship together, uh, worship through prayer, worship through the teaching of God's word. Um, this is a special night, and we are, like I said, just so stoked that you guys are here. Um, here's the deal, man. For me, part of my story um, is in college, like in, right in the middle of my four years of college, I came to this breaking point in my life where I realized, man, I was just passively coasting through my spiritual life. I had completely taken advantage of my salvation and kind of just viewed it as my ticket to heaven, and I wasn't doing anything about it. But guys, we see in scripture this invitation, this call, and these commands from Christ for us to take initiative in specifically and intentionally following Jesus. And here at CBU, right, a university committed to the Great Commission, we see that, man, Jesus, he calls us to go and make disciples. And that requires action. That requires us to be active in our spiritual lives. Amen? So as we look at SL Night, there's three specific reasons why we gather together on a weekly basis here at CBU. And the first is we want to encourage you in God's word. We want you to hear from the source of truth that we believe is the truth and to teach and encourage you from God's word. Amen. And the second thing is that we want to give you a vision for making disciples. We want to continue to cast this vision for you because we know that vision leaks and we have really short memories. And so we need to be reminded of what Christ gives us as a vision of moving toward being a world mature disciple maker. Amen. That's what we want to do. And the last thing is this, is we want this space to be a place where we can con connect you and we can launch you into opportunities where you can continue to grow for a lifetime. That when you graduate, your spiritual growth will not stop here, but we will continue to see and hear you guys sharing the gospel in your cities, in your jobs, to your family members, wherever you live. And you will find lost people because you have a heart like God. Amen. And that is what we want to continue to do here. So tonight is a special night, our last SL night, an opportunity for us to just, again, worship together as a community. Now, I want you to see and look back. We have a ton of staff members in the back, Spiritual Life staff members, Discipleship staff members, and all over the room as we do go through this night. Uh, this is a space, is a free space for us to respond in worship, whether it's on your knees, because you need to posture your physical body to what is happening in your heart to worship God and reorient your heart, your mind, your soul to giving him the glory, or you need to go and you need to confess, or you need to pray with someone, or you need to respond, whatever it is, that is what tonight is about for us to worship God through teaching of his word, through musical worship and prayer. That is what tonight is. So you will see actually a rhythm tonight of, of musical worship, of the teaching of God's word, and then prayer, and then again, you'll see this rhythm throughout the night. And we want to invite you to respond as God is moving and the Holy Spirit is moving here tonight. And the last thing is this, man, if, if you aren't connected to, to what we're doing on campus here at CBU, to growing spiritually, and you're like, I just have never kind of gotten into the connection of, of a staff member or someone who is, I don't, I need someone to help me grow spiritually. You can actually go on our Instagram uh, and you can click the link in bio and you can set up a meeting with one of our staff in spiritual life. We want to meet with you. you we have space for you to grow with us. Amen? So let me pray, and we're going to jump into the night. Let's do it. Let's bow our heads. Father God, we thank you for tonight. We thank you even just for a space where we can come here and we can freely worship you. And so God, I pray that whatever is going on in the lives of these students here tonight, 
that God, that we would respond in obedience to the truth from your word, to the moving of your Holy Spirit in us, God. I pray, I pray, I pray um, that we would not ignore this, that we would take initiative, we would take action, and we would respond in obedience to you, God. We pray these things in your name. And everyone said, let's stand and let's worship. Amen, amen. Well, it's great to be here. My name is John Mark. I'm from the Worship Initiative. This is a group of musicians uh, from there. And we've come really just to take a night and be a part of a night where we just stop everything and remind ourselves of the truths of who God is. First, that he's real, that he's good, and that he can be trusted, that his word can be trusted um, above all else. So that's what this first song is about. We've been really open-handed with planning this event. Um, it's not just this typical, oh, we're going to do a couple worship songs and we'll pray and we'll be done. We're really trying to seek the Lord for tonight. And I, I hope you feel that and you know that it comes from a real, genuine place. And we're just excited um, to let go of any kind of performance or pretense or trying to be impressive and really just together, can we seek Jesus? Can we seek his glory? And can we ask, uh, what does he want from us? What could he be calling us to? That's our prayer and our hope for tonight. And join me and let's, uh, let's jump into worship.
were made new by your perfect blood, by your righteousness that we were. God, we believe you, what you say about the world, that you call us to make disciples. So God, tonight we're listening. We believe you and, and help us with our unbelief where we're struggling to believe what you said. Help us just to, that simple prayer, that simple line to take you at your word, that it's good, that it's true, that it's worth giving a life to. Jesus, we love you. Spirit, use this time. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks for worshiping with us, guys. It's going to be an awesome night. Go ahead and take a seat. have a copy of God's Word, and I hope you or somebody around you does that you can look on with, let me invite you to open with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, we're going to do things, and, and John Mark referenced it uh, a little different tonight. Over the next few minutes, I, I want to walk at a pretty high level through this last major passage in Ephesians, and specifically in Ephesians chapter 6. And as we're going to see, it closes with a call to pray. And I want to lead us to do that. I want to lead us into a time of concentrated, earnest, passionate, desperate, honest, humble prayer, seeking God. And these guys are going to come back up and we're just going to walk together through a time of prayer and worship and confession and intercession and surrender. I mean, that's that's why we're here really tonight, right? I love the, the picture that was mentioned earlier, like encourage students, cast vision for disciple making, making disciples who make disciples and connecting students. And I trust, like at the, at the bottom or over all of that, we're here tonight to meet with God. And all those things will happen. Encouragement, vision, connection. Those are all the overflow of meeting with, with God. In the church I pastor back in Metro DC, over the last month, God has ignited a fresh hunger in our people, just, just convicted that we've been just going through motions. We come on a Sunday, a few songs, sermon, song, and, and not that there aren't there's not beauty in just ordinary means of grace, but if we're not careful, we can get so caught up in the motions that we don't soak in the reality of what's happening. And a few weeks ago, our, our worship gathering that uh, starts at 11 usually is finished by 1230. 
we went till almost four o'clock in a way nobody had planned. And I've never experienced on a Sunday morning. Uh, the next day, our pastors got together in the morning. And we were like, I think we need to get together again tonight. And, and so we just put out a call. Like, I don't know who will come, but if 20 people show up, 20 people will seek God, and it'll be awesome. If more people, that'll be awesome. So awesome or awesome, we'll go for it. And so we just sent out an email that afternoon, like, hey, come together tonight. Well, a lot more people than 20 showed up, and we gathered around 7.30, and about 10, 10.30, we were still going strong. And the only way I could like stop that, that night was like, all right, let's come back together again tomorrow night. And so we did, and the next night, the next night, and uh, and it's just carried over into subsequent evening nights and Sunday morning gatherings. Just a hunger. We we want to know God and worship God and hear from God, and it's led to just time and prayer and confession people confessing addictions, people confessing, I mean, I, couples, one turning to the other and confessing adultery in the gathering or sexual immorality or people just confessing, I'm, I'm experiencing like suicidal thoughts and just need some people to pray for me like so many, praying for people on one night who come to faith in Christ the next night, just seeing people come to Christ. We uh, think about just a couple days ago, this woman, uh, Buddhist background from Vietnam, who has just heard the gospel for the first time over the last few weeks and came to faith in Jesus. So just wanting to see God move in ways that can only be explained by his hand and only be attributed to his glory. And so that's kind of where I'm living right now. And so coming here, I was just telling uh, the guys which we were leading and, and just saying, let's pray and let's just ask God to lead our time according to his word, by his spirit. So especially when the text we're looking at ends with a call to pray at all times in the spirit. Well, if we're supposed to do that at all times, I think that includes tonight. So let's pray in the spirit. Uh, so, all right, let's just dive in uh, and let the word and the spirit do the work. Um, you know, John Mark just prayed. I want to pray again. Uh, God, please, as we prepare to hear your word right now, I, just, I pray Isaiah 66, 1 and 2, over this gathering. This is the one you esteem, he who is humble and contrite in spirit and who trembles at your word. God, we, we pray for a, a holy sense of trembling in the word we're about to hear from you, we would realize we're not, this is so different from anything else we could read in the world. We're, we're about to hear from you in your presence. We pray for humility and contrition of spirit in this gathering, that you would remove pride Fear of man. From our hearts and our minds, and you would bring us humbly to meet with you and hear from your word, and help us to respond as you lead us, as you lead us by your Spirit. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Okay, Ephesians chapter 6, start, we'll start in verse 10. The Spirit of God says, 
finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Okay, so much here. So high level. If you're taking notes, I just want to show you, and we're going to fly through these seven high-level truths in this last part of Ephesians 6 that I, th I think will lead us to straight into praying. So one, we live in a spiritual world. We live in a spiritual world. That's an obvious reality based on this passage, right? It's reference to, you can circle it, rulers, authorities, cosmic powers, spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Let's just acknowledge, we don't, we don't think like this. We, we don't live like this. We live in a rationalistic, naturalistic, Western mindset that explains everything by science and technology. So to say that you believe in the existence of spiritual rulers and authorities and forces, it sounds like you believe in dragons and elves. Like in our worldview, if you can't see it, if you can't touch it, taste it, smell it, feel it, hear it, it doesn't exist. Like seriously, how can you believe God controls thunder and lightning when meteorologists can use satellite pictures and computers to predict storms a week before they even happen? How can you say a personal tempter engages our wills in a battle of good and evil when we know it's the configurations of our DNA and our family history that lead us down certain paths. Our worldview has deadened people to the reality of the spiritual world, including you and me. We, we see spiritual explanations as religious fancy as kind of out there. If you've read C.S. Lewis' screw tape, letter, screw tape Letters, you would remember when the older demon says to the younger demon, Wormwood, he says, I do not think you will have much difficulty in keeping the patient in the dark. The fact that devils are predominantly comic figures in the modern imagination will help you. If any faint suspicion of your existence begins to arise in his mind, suggest to him a picture of something in red tights and persuade him that since he can't believe in that, he therefore cannot believe in you. So we usually think about spiritual explanations as crazy, or at least uncommon, kind of weird. Maybe that stuff happens in different parts of uh, the world, remote places in the world, but not in everyday middle-class American life. We are so fooled and so foolish. We're like the 
story of Elisha's servant in 2 Kings chapter 6, we need our eyes open to the reality that right now in this room and all over this campus, there are vast numbers of spirits that exist all around us, good and bad. There are glorious beings that would take our breath away if we could see them. And there are evil beings that would horrify us if we could see them all around us. We live in a spiritual world, which leads to the second truth. We are involved in a spiritual war. We're involved in a spiritual war. We wrestle. The word there in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, is literally to fight in a contest against these rulers and authorities and cosmic powers of darkness and spiritual forces of evil. Whether we realize it or not, this spiritual battle is happening around us, within us, affecting all of us, wherever you are, when you are alone in your dorm room or your apartment, or you're sitting in a class, this war is happening within you, around you. When you scroll through your phone, there is a spiritual fight happening for your heart and mind. Your thoughts, your desires, your words, your actions, your interactions, your relationships, they're all immersed in this spiritual war. Which leads to the third truth. The scope of this spiritual war is universal. The scope of this spiritual war is universal. And I mean that in a couple of different ways. First, this spiritual war encompasses every part of your life. You think about all that Ephesians has covered to this point. For those of you who've been here each night, as you walk through Ephesians from unity in the church to holiness in our lives to marriages, the beginning of this chapter, relationships with parents and authorities, even evil authorities, this spiritual war encompasses every facet of your life. So the scope of this spiritual war is universal in your life and not just in your life, in everybody else's life. There's a battle raging not just for your soul, but for the souls of every single person on this campus and every single person on this planet in every nation, tribe, people, and language of the earth. There is a battle raging for the people around us and peoples around the world. Paul closes this whole passage with a reference to all the saints working for the spread of the gospel in all the world. The scope of the spiritual war is universal, which leads to the fourth truth. The stakes in this spiritual war are eternal. Salvation of your soul, verse 17, and others' souls is at stake. Salvation that's only possible through the proclamation and reception of the gospel. It's what Paul goes on to talk about at the end of the passage. Salvation through the gospel. So casualties in this war don't merely lose an arm or an eye or even an earthly life. Casualties in this war lose everything, even their own soul, and enter with the devil into a hell of everlasting torment that will never, ever end. That's what's at stake in this spiritual war. I don't want to over-dramatize this, but I don't actually think that's possible. This is the glaring truth of this passage and all over the Bible. There is a capital G, God, over this world who wants all people to be saved. There's a little g, God, in this world who wants all people, including every person in this room, to burn in hell. You put this together with the universal scope of this war on this campus, there is a devil and a host of demons actively working 
to damn every single person on this campus. And in a world where there are three billion people who've still not been reached by the gospel, there is a devil and a host of demons that are actively working to keep them in the dark so they will be damned forever. There's a devil and demons who are working to keep cultural Christianity alive and well that turns a deaf ear and a blind eye to billions of people who haven't even heard the gospel. Which leads to the fifth truth. Our adversary in this spiritual war is strong. Our adversary in this spiritual war is strong. He is the devil. End of verse 11. Diabolos in the Greek, from which we get diabolical. His name literally means the slanderer. Elsewhere he's called the accuser, the liar, the destroyer. God, in his word, does not describe the devil as a wimp trying to harm you. God describes the devil as a lion looking to devour you. So let's believe God on this one. Let's realize that if our adversary was a man and he possessed merely human strength and ingenuity and craft, then we would be okay fighting this battle with human means. But he is not human. And in our flesh, we are no match for him. We can't fight spiritual battle with natural weapons. We fight spiritual battle with spiritual weapons. Which leads to truth number six. Our enemy in this spiritual war is strong, but our ally in this spiritual war is stronger. His name is Jesus. God in the flesh, the sovereign Lord with all authority over all things, including Satan, sin, and death itself. Which is why the Spirit of God tells us in this passage from the start to do what? Be strong, not in yourself, but in the Lord and in the strength of his might. It basically says the same thing, just in case we didn't get it the first time. And then the Spirit of God tells us, put on the full armor of who? of God. And this is where we have to be careful in our understanding of the spiritual armor here, as if this is, you know, you hear people say, you need to put this on every morning. What are you talking about? Like, if this is spiritual armor to wear, why would you take it off at night? You keep it on all the time. You have to be careful not to overinterpret it, like the belt of truth. This is, truth is what holds up our pants. Like, trying to, well, I just, I was thinking as I was meditating on this passage, well, then why didn't Paul mention pants? Like, surely we're not supposed to go to battle without pants. Like, the whole picture of the armor of God here revolves around being clothed with the character of God, with the power of God, with the person of Christ, our ally, his truth. You just kind of walk through the armor. It's his truth, the truth of Jesus Christ, the righteousness of Jesus Christ, the gospel of peace that's found in Jesus. It's faith in him. This is the Christian life, Galatians 2, 20. I've been crucified with Christ. I don't even live anymore. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. Christ in me. Christ all over me. That's how I live. 
His blood has saved me, helmet of salvation. His spirit fills me. His word, a sword in my hand and on my heart and in my mind as I meditate on it day and night. This is the Christian life here. And by his power in us, you and I do two things. So I write these down. So one, we stand firm against the devil's schemes. We stand firm. Three times that's the language. You look at verse 13, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand. There's the first one in the evil day. And having done all to stand firm. There's the second one. Stand, therefore. And three times we stand firm in Christ against all the devil's schemes. So one, we stand firm, and then two, we press forward as we spread the gospel. We are not just on the defense in this spiritual war. We are on the offense. We are, the language is boldly proclaiming the mystery of the gospel. Even if that means they put us in chains, Paul says. We declare it boldly as we ought to speak. We don't sit on the sidelines in this war. We stand firm and we press forward. This word is calling you to stand firm against an adversary who is attacking you on a moment by moment, day by day basis. And God is calling you on this campus to Press forward and fight spiritually for the souls of people on this campus. For the souls of people in this city. To love and lay down your life for them. Throw aside your fear of what others might think of you. And declare the gospel boldly to them. And to not stop here. Friends, there are three billion people in the world who don't even have access to this gospel right now. Nobody's even there to tell them, and we have more opportunities, just talking about this with a group before we came in here, more opportunities today to get the gospel to them than ever before in history. Paul, who's writing this, could have only dreamed about the opportunities you and I have in this room to get the gospel to the nations. We were talking about it, like it took Paul months to travel from one city to the next. We can get anywhere in the world in a day. Paul never could have dreamed of a machine that would take us anywhere in the world in a day. It took him a long time to write letters, send them weeks. You and I have a device in our pockets that can lead us to waste our lives or we can actually leverage this device and communicate with people around the world in multiple languages the greatest news in the world. Travel, technology, globalization of the marketplace. And we have so many opportunities to press forward and declare this gospel boldly in hard to reach places. It is time to stop fighting artificial battles consumed with getting likes on a phone or money in our pockets or comfort for our lives in a world that's all going to burn up really soon. It's time to press forward in the spiritual war for the nations that will matter forever. This is the battle you were made for. To surrender your all to Jesus, the author of your salvation and ally in this spiritual war, confident that, truth number seven, the outcome of this spiritual war is irreversible. The outcome of this spiritual war is irreversible, guaranteed, already determined. I love the last word of Ephesians, 
I'm just kind of soaking this in today as I was reading this chapter. Incorruptible, yes. We are called to that which is incorruptible, immortal, imperishable, pure forever. I have good news for you tonight. This war is already won. We are not fighting for victory. We are fighting from victory. If you know the words to Martin Luther's famous hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. A Mighty Fortress is Our God. A bulwark never failing. Our helper he amidst the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great and armed with cruel hate. On earth is not his equal. Did we in our own strength confide, our striving would be losing. We're not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. Dost ask who that may be? Christ Jesus, it is he. The Lord of hosts is his name, from age to age the same, and he must win the battle. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God has willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. That word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abideth. The spirit and the gifts are ours through him who with us sideth. So let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also the body they may kill god's truth abideth still his kingdom is forever this is what we're a part this is your life this is my life so i want to lead us to engage right now in spiritual battle with the spiritual weapon of prayer of worship Praise and confession and surrender. So let's start by doing this. I want to invite these guys to come on up and uh, I want I want to invite us to start by declaring the glory of our God, the whole aim of the devil is to destroy the people of God and defame the glory of God. So as the people of God, we're gonna, we're gonna do the opposite. We're gonna engage in battle and declare all across this room, not just with rote singing, but with authentic hearts. There's no one like you. You are worthy of all glory and all honor and all. We're going to proclaim that in such a way that rulers and authorities and cosmic powers of darkness and spiritual forces of evil hear us saying, there is only one God and he's worthy of all glory. So I want to invite you as we sing this song, and as mentioned earlier, I just want to invite you to have freedom during this time and like yes to stand and lift your hands and shout in praise to God or if it's appropriate if the spirit of God so leads you to fall on your knees to move out in the aisles or in the front or wherever just fall on your knees or prostrate on your face and to give praise and honor and glory to God. And as we do that, I pray that God would lead us to see his glory and know his glory and enjoy his glory in deeper ways in this gathering than we have 
before we came into this gathering. And he's infinite in his glory, which means there's more glory to be enjoyed tonight than you enjoyed yesterday. So let's step fully into it. God, we we want to proclaim all around this room right now that you are great and greatly to be praised. That there is no one like you. You are holy, holy, holy. The Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of your glory. And we want to sing about your glory right now. We want to tell you the depth of our hearts pray in authentic, spirit-led ways. We love you, we honor you, we praise you. So can we stand to our feet or if appropriate, fall to our knees, just right now, stand to our feet and do anything else the Lord is leading you to do. Let's praise him.
this room just one at a time and sure people will speak over each other but just God you are God I praise you because you are our and just fill in the blank you are this you are that you are our this and just shout out just one sentence prayers of praise and adoration to God Shout it out where everybody could hear it.
let's all do it at the same time. Just the same time, all of us shouting out, God, you are. We praise you because you are. We thank you for you are. Just go for it all at the same time, out loud. Keep going, keep going. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights above. Praise him all his angels. Praise him all his heavenly hosts. Praise him sun and moon. Praise him all your shining stars. Praise him you highest heavens and you waters above the skies. Let them praise the name of the Lord. For he commanded and they were created. He set them in place forever and ever. He gave a decree that will never pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all ocean depths, lightning and hail, snow and clouds, stormy winds that do his bidding, mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, small creatures and flying birds, kings of the earth and all nations, you princes and all rulers on the earth, young men and maidens, old men and children, let them all praise the name of the Lord. His name alone is exalted. His splendor is above the earth and the heavens. He's raised up for his people a horn, the praise of all his saints, of Israel, the people close to his heart. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song, his praise in the assembly of the saints. Let Israel rejoice in their maker. Let the people of Zion be glad in their king. Let them praise his name with dancing. Make music to him with a tambourine and harp for the Lord takes delight in his people. He crowns the humble with salvation. Let the saints rejoice in this honor. Sing for joy on their beds. May the praise of God be in their mouths. And a double-edged sword in their hands to inflict vengeance on the nations and punishment on the peoples, to bind their kings with fetters, their nobles with shackles of iron, to carry out the sentence written against them. This is the glory of all the saints. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and lyre. Praise him with tambourine and dancing. Praise him with the strings and flute. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's sing that. Great are you, Lord. Above all creation, above all nations, great are you, Lord.
Father in heaven, uh, hallowed be your name in all the earth. Show the greatness and glory of your great name in all the earth, so that all the earth will shout your praise. And we say, we want to live to shout your praise.
brother is going to lead us in a song of confession. So feel free to join in, but don't bypass needed time and confession before God. And then I want to add, this is straight from James chapter 5. your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. That's a command to confess sins to others and to pray for others amidst struggles with sin. So I want to invite you if you'd be so bold or willing during this time. So these guys will be singing over us. Again, feel free to join in, but maybe what you need to do during this time is turn to somebody around you or those leaders from spiritual life staff and others are in the back. Maybe you need to find somebody and just say, hey, will you pray for me? And obviously we don't, we don't confess sins to each other directly to God through Jesus, through faith in Jesus, and be forgiven of our sins. But there's obviously healing that's found in confessing sins to each other and praying for each other. So how might the Lord be leading you to do that right now? Again, maybe with somebody around you, or maybe somebody in the back that you can just go to, they're back there, they're willing to pray for you. As the Spirit leads, let's not just confess sin before God, but confess sin to each other and pray for each other. So you respond as the Lord leads, and uh, these guys will be singing this over us. Obviously, feel free to join in at any point, but let's, God, we just pray that you would help us to confess now in all the ways you're calling us to confess, to not hold back. First John 1 9, we confess our sins. You're faithful just to forgive us of our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We, just, we want your cleansing. We need your forgiveness. So we pray for honest confession, for humility. Remove pride from us that would keep us from confession of sin before you or others as you lead us. So as we sing this, you respond however the Lord is leading you to.
grace is found is where So when the accuser tries to be, to make you feel guilty for those sins you've confessed, remind the accuser in spiritual battle that you are clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That when God sees you, he sees the very righteousness of his son. For all who trusted in Jesus, and you know, even as I say that, in a room this size, like, 
if you've never put your faith in Jesus to be your righteousness, let this be the moment. Let tonight be the night when you say, God, I need you to forgive me of my sin. I trust in what Jesus did on the cross, his resurrection from the grave, to make the way for me to be forgiven of all my sin and restored to relationship with you. Which uh, just makes me wanna, can we, can we sing about the gospel? I don't know, yeah. we'll praise the name or in Christ alone or something. Like just celebrate the gospel in this room. Like celebrate the salvation, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness that is ours in Jesus because of what he did on the cross for us. Let's, let's celebrate the gospel. i 
so glad you just went there, John Mark. Bye. I, I was just thinking, I would love for us to have a moment where we pray for people in this room who are, I mean, the words that were coming to my mind, like walking through storms right now. in this room who would say I'm walking through a storm I'm in a valley and I, I think that could be for any number of different reasons could be just things going on in your life your relationship your family just, you're walking through a valley and if that's you I want to give you an opportunity in just a minute just to stand up where you are just a few people, just people who are around you to then just come, put a hand on your shoulder and just pray over you. And you can, you can share with those people just I mean, if they don't already know you, your name, and that could be it. Or you could, you know, just share in a sentence or two how they can pray for you. Um, but you don't have to. You just share as much as or as little as you want. But I, I the adversary at us in the middle of storms to pull us away from faith in God, trust in God, peace in God, joy in God. He attacks through storms, in the middle of storms, and I want us to fight for each other in prayer in the middle of storms represented in this room. Like I, me I mentioned in our church family, that we were, we were praying one night and somebody shared, was given testimony just about how they struggled with depression and suicidal thoughts. And they shared that. I just paused and said, I know this is bold, but I want to ask people around this room, like, if you would say, I struggle with depression or suicidal thoughts, if you'd be willing just to stand and we want to gather around and pray over you. And people stood all across that room. So, again, storms can look any number, like any number of things. And, and I would encourage you not to think, well, I don't know if my storm's as big as somebody else's storm. Like, it's not about comparing storms. It's just, if you would say, I'm walking through a valley and storm, and I would love uh, just people to pray for me. Um, and again, you can share as little or as much with those folks as they pray for you as you'd like. But if you would say, yeah, that's me, can I invite you to stand right now? Just all across this room. I, I hope you know this is a safe place to do this. Like, this is what we do. You know, just come on, put a face on, like everything's all going perfect. It's not. We're walking through all kinds of things in this room. stand up and uh, just kind of go either towards somebody or just kind of pray for people. And I just want to invite you, ask them if you don't already know their name, just the name and then anything they would share just real briefly, how they can pray, how you can pray. And then I want to invite you to start praying. Everybody out loud at the same time, just pray over them. Just start interceding for them out loud and just let's lift our voices across this room and, and fight in prayer 
for people who are walking through struggles. a prayer over all of us, but feel free to keep praying as the Lord leads around this room. God, we we intercede on behalf of these who stood. We just pray for your grace, your mercy over them in every way they need. God, we pray Philippians 4, supply all their needs. We pray according to the glorious riches that are found in Christ Jesus. We pray that you would guard them from being anxious about anything. You would overwhelm them with the peace that passes all understanding. You would guard their hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. God, we, we pray Isaiah 43 over them. They would fear not for you have redeemed them. You've called them by name and they are yours. When they pass through the waters, you will be with them. When they pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over them. When they walk through the fire, they will not be burned because you're the Lord their God and they are precious and honored in your sight and you love them. God, we pray that even right now as we gather around them, hands on their shoulders that they would know your presence with them, your love for them. They would know that if you are for them, that nothing can stand against them. God, we pray Romans 8, 28. We pray that you would work all these things together that they're walking through for their good, for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purpose. God, we pray for their protection from the adversary in the middle of whatever they're walking through. God, we pray for faith on days when faith is hard to come by. We pray for joy when despair is setting in. We pray for hope to overcome despair. We pray for hope in the middle of sorrow, confusion, 
We pray for wisdom. We pray for your help. God, you say in your word, you are refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. God, we pray that you would be their refuge, and their strength, and their ever-present help. That you would lead, you would guide, you would direct them. God, you would help them to trust in you. Even when that means waiting on you to trust that you are working for their good. God, we pray that you would bless in the middle of these trials, challenges, in ways that draw them closer to you, in ways that draw others closer to you. God, we pray that you would take what the adversary intends for evil and bring good, bring all kinds of good about it through this. God, we pray that you would glorify your name as Jehovah Jireh, the provider. Glorify your name as the healer. Glorify your name as the comforter. Glorify your name as our banner, the one who is committed to covering us with everything we need. God, we, we just we pray for an outpouring of your grace and your mercy, your strength and your help, your hope and your joy and your peace, your comfort over these who stood. And we pray that you would bring about victory through trial and you would show the supremacy of your great name. Even as we long for the day, God, we long for the day when there won't be any more trials, any more sorrows. We can't wait for the day when you will wipe every tear from our eyes. Come, Lord Jesus, come quickly, we pray. And help us, help us to hold fast, faithfully until that day, we pray. So we pray all these things specifically over those who've stood in the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Let's sing that. Jesus, you're our cornerstone. We walk through trials, walk through storms. You are our rock. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood. trust the sweetest friend but only trust in Jesus my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus blood and righteousness I dare not trust, I dare not trust the sweetest friend, but only trust in Jesus' name. Christ Yeah. 
that song and that time in prayer just in my own heart and then my heart goes can you imagine walking through this storm without the Lord who's sovereign over the storm like without Jesus without the hope the joy and the peace that are found in Jesus so I know, I know it's it's getting late, but I, I surely we need to press in and do some spiritual battle on behalf of people on this campus who don't know Jesus and just press in and intercede right now for people by name just all across this campus and this city who who don't know Jesus. Like I just got finished yesterday reading Exodus 32. I won't preach a whole sermon on it, but it is that text. God says, these people, I was the golden calf. These people deserve my judgment in their sin. And God says, I'm gonna destroy them. Moses steps in the gap and he prays for God to show mercy to this people. And what happens? God relents and shows mercy to this people. God did what Moses asked. As he stood in the gap and spiritually fought battle on behalf of this people, he prayed and God acted. And there's tons we could talk about there. It's not that God changes his mind. God's will is as settled there as it is anywhere in Scripture. But that's part of the point. God has ordained our prayers to be the means by which his salvation, his mercy spreads in the world. God's ordained your prayers, my prayers, for people who are lost around us to be a means that he uses to bring about salvation in their life. So let's do that. So can we just, can we turn and, and get together with a few people around you and let's just start praying right now for people who don't know Jesus, people who don't know Christ on this campus, start praying for people by name, praying for groups of people, like whatever, however the Lord leads. But, but think, we're gonna kind of do this in two ways. We'll pray for people we know and then we'll pray for people we don't know. Uh, we'll start with people we know. So can you do that? Just kind of get together with a few people around you and let's start praying. Let's let's. Pray, intercede right now in prayer for people who don't know Jesus on this campus. Or people in your life who don't know Jesus in your sphere of influence. Just call out for them and, and obviously include praying for boldness to share the gospel with them. Pray that God would use you as an instrument in their lives to lead them to Jesus. So go for it.
Again, you keep praying as the Lord leads. Don't let me stop you. But God, you hear all across this room. You hear names. We're lifting up before you. People you've created. People you love. That you desire to save. Second Peter 3, 9, you desire all people to come to repentance. You desire every single person on this campus to know your love. We pray that you would draw them to yourself. God, show your power to save. On this campus, we pray for multitudes of people to turn to you, Jesus. God, we pray for people to be saved from nominal cultural Christianity and to be saved from all kinds of other sin and pictures of self. God, we pray that you would show the power of the gospel to save in spiritual awakening on this campus. And God, we pray for holy boldness. We pray Ephesians 6. God, I pray that over specifically the students in this room, that you would enable them to proclaim the gospel boldly as they ought. That they would not fear what others think about them. They would not fear messing up. They would boldly share the gospel with others with compassion, with love, with humility. And God, we pray that you would draw people to yourself, draw friends dorm mates, apartment roommates. God, you would draw family members. You would draw people all across this campus to yourself. And in this city, God, in the surrounding area, God, we pray for the spread of the gospel in this city, among the nations in this city. God, we pray for the, the gospel would emanate from this campus, spread from this campus, and there would be a boldness in people sharing and an openness in people hearing and there would be a turning of many hearts to you. God, only you can do that. We pray, we plead for salvation to spread on this campus and in this area in ways that can only be explained by your hand and only be attributed to your glory, we pray. Knowing, believing in the power of your gospel to save. We just pray Romans 1 16 that they would not be ashamed of the gospel, but to believe it is the power of God for the salvation of all who believe. And we pray all of that for all these names in Jesus' name. Amen. And so there's one more, one more way I want to invite us to pray. I want us to lift our eyes beyond this campus and beyond the city, specifically to three billion people who are unreached by the gospel right now. So here's the deal. If you don't already have it downloaded on your phone, I wanna invite you right now, and this is gonna help you in your prayer time, to download an app on your phone. It's called Unreached of the Day. So you can search it real quick. If you don't already have it, just go to the App Store and download Unreached of the Day. Unreached of the Day. It's Joshua Project. And what it is, it's just got every day a people group that has not been reached with the gospel. And I want to invite us right now. So the people group of today you'll find is the Argoon of Pakistan. Or you can search and you can just see a list of all kinds of unreached people. And just click on one, it tells you information about that people group, the Changar of India, 3,200 of them, no known followers of Jesus, tells you a little bit about them. And then you can go to another one, the Southern Bai people. You can go to the uh, Khas people of Bhutan. You can just keep going on and on. There's 7,000 of them. So we're not gonna pray for all 7,000 tonight although that would be awesome. Do that one night. Like somebody get that together. Just be like, we're gonna pray for every unreached people group in the world tonight. That's good, we need to do that. Uh, so anyway, sorry, I'm getting sidetracked. Um, but if you don't already have that, this will help you right now in these groups around this room. Let's pray for the spread of the gospel. 
to unreached people groups. And believe, Exodus 32, that God will use our prayers right now as part of his plan to bring about salvation among these people groups. Now let's stand in the gap for them. Many of these people groups, hardly anybody's praying for them. So let's press in right now and pray for unreached people groups. And at the same time, let's make sure to pray, God, use my life however you want to reach these people groups. So go for it. Let's pray for the unreached people of the world. There's three billion of them. We got so many people we can pray for right now. And hopefully that Unreached of the Day app will help you do it. So go for it. God, oh God of the nations, all around this room as we keep praying, we just, we take our place gladly before your throne and we intercede on behalf of the nations, specifically nations and groups of people who have never heard the gospel and don't have access to the gospel right now. God, we pray. You would forgive us as your people for 
being negligent in the spread of the gospel to them, God, for living our lives, creating a whole culture of Christianity that turns a, a blind eye and a deaf ear to billions of people who haven't even heard the gospel. God, we pray you'd forgive us and transform our hearts to be like your heart. God, we pray for the spread of the gospel to all the nations of the earth. We pray for the Argon people of Pakistan. God, we pray you'd send out laborers to them. We know the harvest is plentiful. Workers are few. Send out laborers. Maybe from even in this room, we say, here are our lives tonight. Who are you calling from among us to go to the Argun of Pakistan? Any of us, God, we want to go if that's what you're leading us to do. I want to go if that's what you're leading me to do. God, you love that people group. Jesus, you died to ransom that people group for God. That's what your word says. You love them. You died for them. We pray that you would draw them to yourself, that you would cause disciples to be made and churches to be planted among the Argun of Pakistan. We pray for your glory among the Argun and 7,000 other people groups like them. God, we pray for the spread of Jesus' fame among all the nations. And God, we, we pray I just pray specifically over this room and this campus. I pray that this place would be a base in this spiritual war that is sending out missionaries and disciple makers for the nations all around the world. God, we, I, I pray there would be unreached people groups reached for the first time because of students on this campus responding to your call, obeying your call. God, I pray even tonight, even right now in this moment, for just a spirit of surrender. Acts 13, that God, maybe even right now in this moment, you would speak to some hearts like you did Paul and Barnabas. You'd say, I'm setting you apart for the spread of the gospel where it hasn't gone. I pray for that to happen even now, God, by your spirit. us to hear and obey. Here we are, send us. God, I pray that in the next year that the number of people spending their summer or more semester, year in unreached places in the world would multiply exponentially. I praise you for your grace and the 150 or so who are going this summer. God, I pray that you would multiply that number exponentially in the days to come, that there would be a sending movement on this campus that is echoing among the nations for your glory. I, pr I pray there would be ripple effects among the unreached because of what you by your spirit are doing on the Cal Baptist campus. God, we, we, we pray you'd open our eyes in a fresh way, missional awakening to your great glory, to the nation's great need, and that you would send out multitudes more laborers into the harvest field. And God, we know, we know those 150 that are going and others that will go are going into battle on the front lines of 
spiritual warfare among the unreached. God, we pray that you would strengthen them, embolden them, help them, protect them. And no matter what it costs them, God, we pray for the spread of the gospel through them. And we pray for their joy in the process. And we pray for your glory to be made known among the nations through their lives, through our lives. God, we are your people. We praise you for your grace in our lives. We pray that you would help us to live for your glory among the nations, among all the nations of the earth. Ah, I think this is, John, Mark, and I were talking about where, where we should land, and I think this is where we should land. The song we sang at the beginning may have been new to some of you. Uh, we're fighting a battle that's already won, and we know how the story ends. So I want to read how the story ends and then invite us to close by singing that song one more time in the middle of spiritual war. This is where the battle's going to end. Revelation 7, verse 9. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes, and where have they, from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. He said to me, These are the ones coming out of great tribulation. They've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And listen to how they're described. They're before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. That is how the story ends. So let's, let's sing about that as we prepare to scatter and engage in more spiritual battle. Let's sing about how the story ends.
Thank you all so much for being with us late tonight. That's been awesome. Thanks for worshiping with us. Ryan? Can we say thanks? Appreciate you guys. Thank you. Say thanks for David over here. I'm going to pray and we'll be done. Take the spirit to your dorms. Uh, take the spirit uh, to your living areas, to your classrooms. Boldly share the gospel and continue to pray. Let me pray for us. Father, we, th we pray for boldness. We pray for courage. Uh, we know your gospel changes lives. Uh, we've seen it in our lives, and we pray that, that your gospel will be shared boldly on this campus. 
But we also pray that the students here would, uh, would move, they would pray uh, for the nations, and, and that they would, they would volunteer to go. God, we, we pray for billions right now who are starting Ramadan, who are trusting in the, the writings of Muhammad. We pray, we pray for the labors that you've sent there, and we pray that you would raise up more labors uh, for Muslims, that, that, uh, that, that they would go, they would be sent. We pray that we would be people uh, that would go. Thank you for the spirit um, that, that works mightily within us, and we pray that, uh, that we would lean on you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much.